Good to be in the house of the Lord together. We're going to open this morning uh, with, with a thing that we call a collect prayer. That is when we collect all of our prayers into one prayer that kind of just, uh, you know, often when we have our, our corporate prayer time, then we'll have a pastor up here who is, who is saying a prayer out loud on behalf of the whole church. Well, today we're all going to pray out loud together on behalf of the church. So let's collect our prayers into one prayer. We pray this prayer together. We implore you, Almighty God, mercifully to look upon your people, that by your great goodness we may be governed and preserved evermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.
And it's going to be hard for us to really put into words what happened this week at camp. But I think you'll be able to tell a little bit from some of the pictures and hopefully from what the kids are going to share with you. And their cue is... Name Chip! <laughs> Get up here. They didn't think I'd do that at camp, and I did. <laughs> we had nine of us, ten counting me, that went to camp. And the only thing that I really missed out on, and you all know why, is I didn't get to spend as much time with the boys. Because they couldn't be in our camp. <laughs> but I did hear from several of the counselors in their cabin. They really stepped up to the plate this week and were leaders. And that is awesome for me. This is our before picture. And Keep this in mind as we go through the pictures, if you can see what God did by the last picture. Um, our theme this year was impact. Image. Image, excuse me. Image. They got more sleep than I did. <laughs> Out of Romans 12, 1 to 2. I have to read my shirt. Um, but all week it was on the image. And we started in Genesis on Monday night. And there's things that they learned about themselves and about us being made in the image of God that I want each of them to share. <laughs> oh. You want to start, Brady? Oh, sorry. Oh, now. Okay, ladies first. Mia, share something from camp. Um, what I liked from camp was mostly all the singing because, you know, people were worshiping God and people just raising their hands over your heads. It just felt so good. And just yourself raising your own hands, feeling the praise of God. It was amazing. Amen. Amen. They're really good. You can feel the connection between you and God. And I feel like through her messages, it strengthened mine and God's relationship. And I think it's going to get strong. Amen. My favorite part is um, like on Friday during our service, we were in a circle praying with a bunch of people. And it felt amazing just to feel all those people praying to God together and worshiping Him and just. Praying with one of the enemy squad 66 people was amazing to me. Um, we had a sermon every day, and after every sermon, we would go in with our cabin groups and we would have a what's called Compline. And during those times is when we just really learned more about each other and how we took into that um, praise and how that message really hit us. And those were some really hard times for a lot of us, and that's whenever our groups really got to know each other and got better. And one of our sermon, or one of our complement groups was about whenever, how Jesus would talk to us and how, if we had anything that we wanted to happen to us, and just answering all our prayers. And this week, I had been waiting for, like, to see what I wanted to do with my life, and for a long time I've been, been debating on what I wanted to do and if I wanted to go into ministry. And this week is that time that God really answered me and was like, Carson, yes, you need to go do this. You need to be a minister. And that was really cool when I was talking about that. Um, I'd say my favorite part about camp was during our, what was it, the guided experience, um, we did this thing called Lactio Divina. Uh, which is Latin for divine reading, and we take a, a certain part of a phrase and we name out 
what spoke out to us, and we read it the second time, uh, you could either change your phrase or word, and you would tell how it associates to you in your life. And then the last time we read it, we say how God was speaking to you through that. And we did that, what was it, three times out of the week? And uh, that, that was pretty, that was my favorite part of camp, honestly. Okay, I got two favorite parts of camp. Uh, I just had to share both of them. Um, my first one is uh, the last night we were at camp. We had WrestleMania in one of the boys' cabins. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good time. And my second is um, learning about God and how if you're at your all-time lows, He's always going to be there to stand by you, and He's not going to go anywhere. And even if you don't feel like anybody loves you, He's always going to love you. Amen. All right, the best part of camp for me was uh, all the incredible people that were there. There was 300 teenagers praising God at one time the entire week, and there are 10 amazing people up on this stage right now, and we all grew closer to God, and it was awesome. Amen. about camp was when during morning prayer and evening prayer I would stay after because I needed some time to talk to God but there's other people in there that would need time and after I would go after I finished I'd always go and either pray with them or pray over them and make sure that they're going to be okay but and that that helped me make a few friends One was, um, I didn't know most of these people before I went on camp, but after camp, I was so close with everybody here. I could tell them anything, all my problems and whatever, and they'll just come like, right. they'll help me out and everything. And my second favorite part was um, our service at night. All the singing they did, like, I, it really like impacted my life, and I wanted to praise God more.
was 300 teens praising God. Some would gather together in the corner somewhere and pray together. But all night when they would sing, this was what our teens were doing. And as we went through, this is our last night together, Thursday night. And we were privileged to be in the same cabin with the Shawnee girls. And we got so close. Uh, Amberly is the Shawnee youth pastor, and then across the hall was another youth pastor from the Missouri side. And all three of us told the girls, God put all of us together for a reason. And we got changed. They didn't know that. But when we arrived, we had to be moved to a different room. And I told Amberly that was a God thing. It really was. Because... Shawnee and this group of girls got so close. They became vulnerable by opening up things that had happened in their lives. I think it was what, Wednesday night? Tuesday night was our first night. And every night when we got back to the cabin after the service, we had the girls talk about the service. And the guys did in their dorm too. And one thing I liked about it, none of us were on a time schedule. We did have a schedule, but this is what we concentrated on was growing in God. And their favorite night of Shauna's was, you remember which night? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say it? Well, the boys are shy. <laughs> so this week we got caught dirt. <laughs> but it wasn't like a bad dirt. It was our pastor that came in and talked pretty much Shauna. And she just gave us a really good message about we all took it kind of like we were dirt. <laughs> and, but it was about how we were created out of nothing and how God breathed life into us. And it was just a really amazing message. But of us messed around with it because we got called dirt. <laughs> but she told us that we were created with dirt and one day we'll turn back to dirt, but it's okay because we're good dirt. And <laughs> but it was just a really good message by Shonda. When they got to the dirt, one thing that stood out to us counselors was God doesn't need an Ikea booklet. And He doesn't need a set of wrenches to put us together. And all week, it was about how good, good we are. Because we are made in His image. Amen. And the scripture in Psalm 51, and I'm going to read it out of the message because this hit perfectly. David says, Generous in love, God give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt, soak out my sins in your laundry. Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me and I'll have a snow white life. To me into foot tapping songs. Set those once broken bones to dancing. Give me, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week out of my chaos of life. That was her whole point this week in Genesis. And she challenged us as leaders. To come back to our churches and challenge our churches. These kids have already probably hit what she called the marketplace. Where when you go to camp, you're on a high for all week and then you start to come down. And Satan's going to be working on these kids, especially because they have shared just a portion from their hearts of what God did for them. In our family time, each one of them, I ask them, what is it? that you want God to do for you this week? What is it 
that you want to have change. The greatest joy was to know as their youth pastor that God did what they asked. That God did the work that all of you were praying for us this week. We can't begin to thank you enough for your love, your support, and your prayers. And these kids are going to need continued prayer. Along with the other teens that didn't make it to camp because of work or vacations or whatever. And next year, I hope this group doubles when we go to camp. But to watch 300 young people, this is them hugging and praying before we left. Go on, Diane. The next one. You remember the before picture? This is our family. This is what happened during camp. That we're taking a picture with our arms around each other. This is what it's all about, folks. This is the church of today. Amen. Not just tomorrow. This is the church of today. And so I challenge you to pray for them, pray for me, that God will continue to give me the wisdom and direction to be their leader. And just pray that what they experienced at camp will just grow. And I've got a shirt that says, when my feet hit the floor, the devil says, uh-oh, she's up. <laughs> That's what I want the devil to say when these kids wake up. Uh-oh, they're up. You guys are awesome. You're great. I love you each one, and I am thankful for the opportunity to be with you this week. Amen. Amen. If I could have the ushers come for the offering. You know, I, I had the privilege of help driving them down there on oh, Monday, yes. and Ron went picked them up on Friday. But after we dropped off and we got there, to Camp Pastor Candy said they had to change change rooms and, and locations, and so it was kind of an upheaval as we tried to get all the stuff out of the van. And Braden came to me and he said, "I mean, this is out in the middle of nowhere. I've never been to this place, Camp Springs. That was my first time to be there, and it was just out in the middle." I didn't know if I could find my way out of there. <laughs> Brady came up to me and he said, I don't belong here. <laughs> and I said, why is that? He said, I'm a city boy. And I said, I don't like this. <laughs> but he told me this morning he's so glad he went. And I'm glad he did too. Brady, God bless you. <laughs> Father, thank you for your goodness to us, for your many blessings. <laughs> that you have given to us this past week. And we pray that you would bless this part of our service as we give back to you in thanksgiving and joy in our hearts for what you have given to us. Bless the gift and the giver in your name. Amen. Amen.
you're invited to join together around the altars this morning as we have our prayer time today. seek your guidance 
for our lives. And I would pray that, Lord, you would inspire us today to a deeper faith and a even a bolder practice. Forgive us when we get stuck in the rigid patterns of thinking and doing that allows such little opportunity for your spirit to move us. So often we have failed to understand that our rootedness in faith is meant to nourish the growth of belief rather than to just keep us in one little place. So Lord, we gather this day to affirm that Your love abounds and to celebrate that Your Spirit is in motion. So lead us, God, and give us courage to follow. Would You anoint your servant today, Pastor Kyle, as he brings us the message you've laid upon his heart. May you give us open hearts, open minds, open ears to receive your word of truth today. Thank you already for being with us and meeting with us in such a special way. But that when we leave here this morning, we'll be able to say within ourselves and to each other, it has been good to be in God's house. We offer these prayers to you this morning. For it's in your name, the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
grew together and they, they loved each other and they grew spiritually the week and this was amazing. So I grabbed this bus selfie on the way home and it's like, this is, this is our group and aren't they amazing? And we were just so, uh, just so thrilled to be a part. It was a spiritual high and I wanted the world to know how proud I was, right? So that's another one of the ways we use social media to get to know each other. Uh, let me show you another one here. We talk about memories. Do you know I used to play in a rock and roll band? Yeah. That's the young man my wife fell in love with. Right you go ahead and go ahead and be jealous of my hair. It's okay. You can you can repent your covetous nature later. Uh, so I shared that on a hashtag TBT Throwback Thursday uh, a few years ago, just saying, hey, this was me. A lot of people that I uh, associate with now uh, didn't know me then and didn't know that that's what I used to do with my time. So uh, I did. So uh, I'm not bringing out uh, the stuff I can, I'm doing on guitar then is not what, what I'm doing here now. Just so you know. We got a little bit of a difference there. So we share our memories on Facebook. Exciting announcements. Uh, we, this is when we found out we were going to have Penny. Minda's sign there says 3 plus 1 equals 4 coming in March. Lucy's sign says Big Sister. My sign just says Stud. <laughs> so, uh, actually our uh, district superintendent, Jaron Rowell, commented on there. And he said, I think Kyle needed some supervision. <laughs> uh, but it's just a thing. You know, we like to share announcements, big things that are coming. Like, that's another way we like to use social media, get to know each other. Another one, last one, pure joy. I said, that was the single greatest morning of my entire life. What might I have been talking about? Anybody? Rose winning the World Series. Not quite. That's close. Look at the uh, date there, 2014. It was wild card. wild card game. That's right, man. The, Royal, the wild card game uh, in 2014. But now the Royals, they hadn't, they hadn't won the World Series up to this point. So uh, at that time, that was the greatest. That was just phenomenal. Uh, I still go back and watch highlights of it. So I just like it was pure joy, and I would just share it with the world and people like that top comment. The feels. Somebody was just so excited with me to uh, to enjoy baseball. So we get you get on social media and you can know me a little bit, but but you really know me from social media and like, you get the whole picture. Obviously, there are so many things that uh, about each other to which we are not privy. And you can get a bird's eye view of my life on Facebook and, and on Twitter. You can get a more complete picture if you and I sit down and we have a cup of coffee together. We talk to each other and carefully kind of get to know each other in community. And I want to know you. We've been at this church for well over a year, and I've gotten to know a lot of great people. And I want to know you, and I want you to know me. Uh, but this exercise in social media is just a goofy example, because I want to talk today about how well God knows you. And then I want to piggyback onto that conversation about how well we can know each other better. So, um, so let's dig into that a little bit. Uh, we had a crazy morning at my house, and the power went out, and a big tree dropped in our backyard and like crushed part of our shed. And uh, we uh, just like it was really hot in our house because the power was out and everything. So I forgot my Bible, but Lucy did not forget hers. <laughs> so, uh, so she loaned me her Bible this morning, and same same stuff in it, except for this one has like a picture of a little girl that says "Meet my brother." I don't know what it's for, uh, but. Um, we're going to read from Psalm 39, so uh, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. You might not have that in your Bible. If you might not have an NLT, that's okay. I'm going to put it up on the screen as well. Can we stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read Psalm 139. It's a famous psalm, verse 1 through 12. Follow along with me. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day, and darkness and light are the same to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, we say our motto together while we're still standing. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, do whatever you want with my life. Trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Alright, you guys can take a seat. Let's dig into this just a little bit. Verses 
1 through 6 of this famous psalm express appreciation for just how well God knows us. He can see the innermost things happening in our hearts and minds. When we're home and when we're away, and He knows us. And this seems like pretty rudimentary stuff, pretty basic theology for a lot of us. We get it. God is big and God is all seen. He knows us. That's not probably new information. But pause for a second. Did you hear it? God can see everything that happens in your thoughts and in your emotions and in your actions. Everything. Are you proud of everything you think or do or feel? You find yourself dwelling on a thought only to realize that that's not the kind of thought you want anybody else to know that you were dwelling on in your mind? The Lord is all seen. He doesn't just know the Facebook version of you. He knows the real you. And I'm not saying this to uh, cast judgment on the thoughts going through your mind. And, and you'll see that as we dig into it. Because there in verse 5, he says, you place your hand of blessing on my head. So you have examined my heart and you know everything about me, yet you still place your hand of blessing on my head. I feel like I read this psalm in waves. First I read it and I'm like, yeah, God is big and powerful and awesome. That's what I get my first time reading through. But then when I slow down, when I do Lectio Divina in this passage, I'm glad you learned that term. That's an important one and a great practice that we can continue far beyond can. Um, when I really slow down, the second time I read through it, I go, yikes. God knows all my thoughts. Nothing hidden. Then my third time I read it, I catch that, that verse, and it says, Wow, you must be a gracious God to know everything that has passed through my head, and you still place your hand of blessing on me, on undeserving me. Then David, the author of this psalm, has a natural response to realizing, I think this is kind of funny when you think about verse 7, has this natural response to realizing that God knows everything. And his response is, I gotta get out of here. His whole second half of this passage is about God's pursuit of us. So in 7 it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light to come around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. He knows you and me. And he is coming for you and me. There's nothing you can do about it. He is coming for you. He is coming. Those words could send chills down someone's spine if they didn't know who Jesus was. He's coming for you. <coughs> and he's bringing grace and he's bringing love and he's bringing mercy that you and I don't deserve. He, that's coming with him. We haven't earned it, but he's coming for us. Remember in Tombstone when Kurt Russell is, is uh, he's Wyatt Earp and he's he's yelling at the uh, at one of the cowboys and he says, "You tell him the law is coming. You tell him I'm coming." And what's he say? You can say it out loud. It's okay. <laughs> he said, "That's right." He says, "And hell's coming with me." All right. He's striking fear in their hearts. It's reason enough to be afraid. Plus, he has an awesome mustache. <laughs> Guess what? Jesus is coming. And grace and mercy and love are coming with him. Amen. We might deserve hell, but that's not what's coming with Jesus. John Stott wrote a book called Why Am I a Christian? In the first chapter, he mentions that he's not a Christian because of his parents' influence, and he's not a Christian because of his own personal decision or his teachers. Rather, he's a Christian because of the relentless pursuit of Jesus. Everywhere he looked, Jesus was there. He could not get away. Jesus' presence is undeniable in the world around us. It's undeniable in creation. It's undeniable in people. David... Uh, says he goes to heaven and God is there. And he goes to the grave and God is there. In the farthest oceans, in the darkest night, he is there. He keeps coming after you. He is relentless in his pursuit of you. His love, like the song, is fierce, like a hurricane. It's too big to escape. If there's a hurricane right there, you're not running away from that. It's, you're in it. His love 
is undeniable and it is coming for you. In that book, I said, John Saro, Why Am I a Christian? He mentions the hound of heaven. Yeah, that's a poem by Francis Thompson, 1893, uh, the English poet. Uh, let me read you a stanza from this poem. From the poem called The Hound of Heaven, a hundred and something years old. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind in the midst of tears. I hid from him. And under running laughter, up vistaed hopes, I sped and shot precip precipitate. Adown titanic blooms of chasm fears. From those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than defeat, all things betrayed me, who betrays me. In other words, from that last line. I know. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. I know you. I'm coming for you. The hound of heaven. I went uh, raccoon hunting with my uncle and my cousins when I was a kid one time. And I am also a city kid. Uh, always been a city kid. Even when I lived in the country for a number of years, I was still a city kid. And I uh, was ready to move back to the city. And um, so most of the men in here probably know way more about hunting than I do. Uh, I don't go hunting, I go bargain hunting, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know much about hunting, but I did go raccoon hunting once uh, when I was a kid. I went out with my, anybody ever been raccoon hunting before? It's pretty fun. Uh, I went out with my uncles and my cousins, and uh, they had uh, these two coon hounds that we took with us. And I just knew them as nice dogs that lived on chains in the front yard, and you could pet them, and they were very nice. Uh, but I learned more about them that night. Uh, we set out at dusk. We had camping gear, shotguns, warm clothes. We had the hounds, and we spent hours in the woods. And I was I was enjoying getting to drink coffee from a thermos. <laughs> I was getting to enjoy uh, sitting around a fire and being in the woods at night and petting the dogs. You know, I was just having fun. <laughs> Then suddenly the dogs just start yowling and they jump and they just take off just like, like crazy. It scared me and they're bounding away. I had no idea what to make of it and suddenly they're just gone into the night. And all you can, you can hear the crunching brush going further and further away. And you can hear their sounds getting further and further away. And my uncle and my cousins jumped up and they started to get the stuff. And I went, what are the dogs? What should we do about the dogs? Call the dogs back. They're running away. You're losing your dogs. And uh, I asked my uncle, like, whistle for them or something. And... He said, no, it wouldn't do any good because they're on the scent and they're probably going to have a raccoon treed, treed, uh, I learned that term that night, uh, and they were not going to stop until we got it. Once those hounds latched onto the scent, there was not anything that you could do to tear them away. So this hound of heaven narrative might conjure up less than beautiful imagery uh, in your mind because when you think of a hound dead set on a scent, you think of a beast, you know, out to kill. But the point of the poem isn't to focus on the hound's mission, but on the hound's drive. It is a well-trained hound, and it is relentless in pursuit of what it is after. Francis Thompson wrote the poem, The Hound of Heaven, reminding you and me that God is relentless in pursuit of us. He will not stop. He will not hold back. He will not give up. There is nothing you can do to, to get him off of your scent. He will keep on coming for you. There's nothing you can do. And eventually you're going to have a decision that you have to make. You will have to make a conscious choice not to give in to his pursuit because he is coming and grace and mercy and love are coming with him. Amen. So, Psalm 139, what can we take away from it? God knows you. God loves you. And God is going to keep coming after you. And you know what else is coming with him? Forgiveness. Like we talked about in the first half of the psalm, he knows you at your innermost. 
The things that you have hidden from everyone else in the world are not hidden from God. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. They are not hidden from God. I have 1,100 friends on Facebook. And the stuff that I post there, uh, you know, people get a glimpse of my life, a highlight reel of, of my life. But I have a much smaller group of close friends that share in my joys and sorrows, you know, and know my story better. And within that small group is my family that know my story even better than that. And even within that small group is my wife who knows me better than anyone else. And we probably all have these, these spheres of intimacy, I think, that you could identify with in your life. You could start very broad, like your Facebook friends or your coworkers or whatever, and then you move more and more and more intimate as these people grow closer to your core. And like it or not, God is at the center of that. Not necessarily because you have invited him or because you confess everything to him, but because he knows you and he made you and he is coming after you and there's nothing you can do to hide any part of yourself from him. I say you, I mean you, us. <clears throat> You might have things, we might have things, or wish we could hide. Or things that you won't even acknowledge out loud in your brain because you don't want to bring them to light and dwell on them and think about them. You just kind of let them hide in the dark corners. Um, and just dwelling on them feels like it would make them real. And this isn't about God's judgment following you around, waiting to smite you. God is at his core forgiving. We can't talk about how well he knows us without talking about how much he wants to forgive us because let's face it, we have all had things in our past that have haunted us that we have needed forgiveness for and some of us have things that we still need forgiveness for. And God isn't, he's not mad at you because of your innermost thoughts as, bar as embarrassed as you may have been over them at one time or another. But love brought Jesus to the cross, not anger. God's desire to forgive you is what put Jesus on the cross. So, not his mad, not, not his anger at you, not because he's just like crossing his arm going, how dare you think that. Instead, he is going, I, you have an opportunity to be forgiven and be set free from this. So what is our role in all of this? We have a response. You learn when you're uh, um, in your pastoral training that uh, teaching is when we just, uh, we just we learn something and we have, a, okay, that was nice and we put it away. But when we have a response to it, when we have something to do, then it becomes preaching. So we have a response to this. Right up into this point, this is teaching. So what is our response to all this? We're going to talk just for a couple minutes about the discipline of confession. And I debated about whether or not to go into this at all, because I could have spent the entire time this week on the hound of heaven, and I had plenty left to say, but I don't get to preach again next week. So I'm going to say everything I want to say. Uh, just, just, a, just a few more minutes. Confession is a discipline that we don't talk about that much. But the truth is, there is absolute freedom that comes with it. A couple of years ago, my wife and I, we had this heart-to-heart -heart where we were completely honest about some things that had kind of been eating away at each other from before we were ever married or even together, just long ago. And it is like... We just both had this heaviness that we had been carrying us inside that we were afraid to tell each other. And when we finally talked it out, it was like this cloud we didn't even know was there lifted off of us. And we went from having a good marriage to having a great marriage after this one conversation. Richard Foster, one of my favorite authors, says, One of the biggest reasons we avoid confession is because we all too often see our church as a fellowship of saints rather than a fellowship of sinners. And we feel that everyone else has advanced so far into holiness that we are isolated and alone in our sin. And we can't bear to reveal our failures and our shortcomings to others because we imagine that we're the only ones with those kinds of failures and shortcomings. But guess what? The church is made of imperfect people. And we are seeking to be like Jesus, but we are still imperfect. We are holiness people. Don't get me wrong. 
So we believe that you can live a life without, where sin is not always present. We believe that. You don't have to wake up every morning. This is important, so pay, pay close attention to this. You don't have to wake up every morning saying, well, I'm only human, so I'll probably sin today even though I don't want to. That's not what we believe. As, Wesley, as Wesleyans, as holiness people, we are pursuing the image of Christ, and part of our calling to holiness is the freedom that he gives us to live without daily sin. However, that does not mean that a sanctified Christian is free from ever sinning for the rest of their life. We are pursuing Christ-likeness, but we haven't arrived at our goal yet. And when we mess up, what do we do with that? Psalm 139 tells us that God knows everything that we think and we do and we feel. And we can pretend that it didn't happen all we want. But if we acknowledge His omnipresence in our lives, we have to know that He's aware of our shortcomings. And private confession is a real and important thing. It is God who provides freedom. So attempting to hide things from him instead of talk them out is not doing you any good. We must confess our sins to God. You have a response. We have a response in confession. But this is the uncomfortable part. There is a corporate aspect to confession. Ugh. I'm going to read you a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, so I'm going to look down because I don't want to mess, it, mess this quote up, okay? This is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great theologian, author, of freedom fighter. Our brother, or sister, he's saying brother, but our, our person to our left or right. Our brother has been given to us to help us. He hears the confession of our sins in Christ's stead, and he forgives our sins in Christ's name. He keeps the secret of our confession as God keeps it. When I go to my brother to confess, I'm going to God. A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone with himself. He experiences the presence of God and the reality of the other person. As long as I am by myself in confession of my sins, everything remains in the dark. But in the presence of a brother, the sin has to be brought to the light. It's not simply enough to acknowledge Psalm 139, that God knows your thoughts. We have been placed in Christian community, in a fellowship of sinners becoming saints. And John Wesley, he calls confession to a brother or sister in the church a means of grace ordained by God. I don't urge you to place confession because I want you to air out your dirty laundry for everyone to see and hear. I want all of us to feel the freedom that comes from forgiveness. And I want all of us to feel the weight lifted from our chest. Richard Foster, who I just mentioned before, tells a story about when he took on his first pastorate. And he was feeling like he was hitting the spiritual roadblock. And he was feeling called to confess, but he wasn't sure what he was feeling called to confess. Like, not a specific thing. He just felt compelled and called, and felt the Spirit leading him to confess. So he called a trusted, dear brother and said, I need to confess to you. Let's meet. And that guy said, okay, we'll meet. And then Richard Foster took three days. And one day, he wrote, sat down with a piece of paper, and he wrote down everything he could think of from his childhood that he might need to get off his chest that maybe he never had. And then the second day, he wrote down everything he could think of from his adolescent college years that he might need to talk about that he's never talked about before. And then the third day, he wrote down everything from his adulthood that he had never confessed to someone but felt like he needed to say out loud. And then he and this dear friend met, and he pulled out the piece of paper, and the other man sat across the table from him, sat quietly and listened as Richard Foster went down his list and read everything to this man. Can you imagine how scary that would be? You're, I mean, he was a pastor. This man could make or break him. He'd just take one little piece of the dirty laundry that was being but Richard Foster just knew that this is, this is what he was called to do. So he trusted in the Spirit, and he knew he had to have this conversation, so he did. And he finished He finished reading this paper, and, and there was silence for a moment. And he picked his piece of paper up, and he began to put it back in his briefcase. And this friend stopped him, and he took the paper from him, and he walked over to the trash can, and he ripped it up into a hundred little pieces, and he dropped it in the trash can. 
And this was an act of physical forgiveness that Foster knew that he needed. And the weight was lifted from him. Though he had confessed to God already, bringing these sins out of the darkness in the light, that's what freed him. And this, this man who, to whom he confessed was gracious enough and merciful enough to know that this is an imperfect man who sits across from me and he is messed up and I have messed up and we're going to say it out loud and then we are going to forgive just like God forgives. And we're going to offer mercy and grace that maybe none of us deserve. My own confession time with my wife years ago was born out of a need for spiritual breakthrough. I knew it was holding me back. And it was only in my confession that I learned that uh, we both had things that we needed to talk about. And it was freeing for both of us. And we didn't step through a spiritual roadblock that day. We burst through a spiritual roadblock. And like Bonhoeffer said, our brother or sister is hears our confession and forgives our sins in Christ's name. Christ still gives ultimate forgiveness, but confession in community brings it out of the darkness into the light. God knows you at your innermost, and he will not come and stop coming after you. And he is relentless in pursuit of you. He's coming, and forgiveness is coming with him, and you have a response to this. Don't try to keep things hidden from him. Be open. There is freedom that comes in confession. Find someone who is wise and gracious enough to hear your confession. Bring it out of the dark. I want this for our whole church. I want the weight lifted. I want us to burst through whatever spiritual roadblock is in front of us. You can feel it physically. I promise you it is transformative. I was talking with a friend about that this week. We had a friend staying with us, and um, she said that she tried to do this in her Sunday school class with a few close friends a couple years ago, and she felt like all she got was, was judgment, and she felt like those people started to kind of scoot their chairs away, like, ugh, sinner. And I said, those people weren't being honest with themselves because they were not brave enough to come forward with their own things that they have kept in the dark at times. Okay? Uh, that's not what we're looking for. So uh, let me just speak to you on the flip side for 10 seconds about being the one. If you are the one receiving the confession, your place is not judgment. Okay? You're the fire and brimstone, you need to put that away. Your place is mercy and grace and forgiveness. So if someone is brave, en brave enough to come to you and say, I need to just get this off my chest, then you be brave enough to put any sort of gossip away and put any sort of, uh, of, of desire to turn this into something that's not and look them in the eye and say, I am here for you. And... Let this be a safe place of forgiveness so all of us can feel open to bringing things out of the darkness and into the light because we are called to do so. Maybe you already have a close friend and this could be a natural relationship. Maybe you need to call one of your pastors. Any of us would be willing to sit down with you and, have, and hear from you, not to pass judgment on you, but to remind you that you are forgiven. To remind you that you sit among others who are on the same journey with you. To remind you that sin does not have to take hold in your heart and hang there. Amen. Psalm 139, you are pursued. You are loved. You are forgiven. Step out of the darkness and into the light and feel that way lifted from God, we are thankful for this community. May we be as you are, gracious and merciful. May we give not because we get, but because you give. <clears throat> Even if someone across the table from us is not offering us grace, may we offer it to them. You never stop pursuing us.
and we know that we have a response to that. We have choices to make when it comes to that. And one of those choices is to talk about things that are not easy to talk about. And so it, if even these just fall on the ears of one person today that is feeling this, this need to confession, God, will you continue to prompt their heart and will you continue to drive them, not so gossip can enter our community, but so forgiveness can continue to be perpetuated in our community. And so that we, as a people, can burst through these spiritual roadblocks that we run into and we can move forward into the light. Will you give us, uh, um, make us brave enough to do so and gracious enough to receive. We love you. Amen. People of God, your Creator knows you at your innermost. No thoughts are hidden from Him. Still, He offers grace. Still, He pursues. Still, His love is boundless and relentless and fierce in its oncoming. Accept His grace. Accept His forgiveness. Through the discipline of confession, let the weight of guilt be taken from you and cast as far as the east is from the west. Then you will know freedom. And in that freedom, may the peace of Christ be with you.